there's so much there that I want to get into with you. Um, so pardon me if I kind of take it back to the beginning of some of the things you said. You, you mentioned an angelic lineage. And I did a piece of channeling, oh gosh, over a decade ago, where they described um, this kind of lineage idea. And so I'm super curious for you to kind of explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so it has been told to me since I was little, and it has been confirmed by multiple sources of seers and celestial guides that I am connected to Archangel Michael. So I am part of his direct lineage um, that I do. I am here for a sacred purpose and it's to help protect the light and the love of the planet. I do know this. So I knew that this was my path. I always saw children also in my visions when I was a child of what I would be doing in terms of serving. But I know that this is part of my sacred purpose and I'm not yet fulfilled on that. And then I've had also experiences, channeled wisdom and just visions and experiences with the angelic lineages that has been undeniable just experiences of where they they come to me and they tell me who I am and what my name is to the creator. And that is what they gifted me. Amazing. Um, in the channeling that I did, what was, and I really think that it was given to me in a simplistic way so that I could understand, because I think when you're talking about cosmology and how everything came into being, like that's way beyond, you know, our human mind to kind of understand. But the way they described it was that um, in the beginning, there was creator and creator was before creator created and then the first thing creator ever created was archangel michael which is why in some religions we've got some interchange between jesus and michael and then through collaboration with michael and creator came into being this pantheon of the archangelic and then through collaboration with the archangelic Michael and source came in the next kind of phase of creation. And you've got like ascended masters, you've got oversouls, you've got all this kind of how, how, right, how creation kind of rolls out. But it was given to me that every single person has a connection to at least one archangel. Well, everyone has a connection to Michael because he's the first, but also the pantheon of archangels. And for me, that's Gabriel and that's Metatron. I've got like def definite connections and they show up in the work that I do. So I'm just wondering if that, does that sound to you? This is what they told me. And I'm just like, okay, well, you know, th that works. I, that's fine. But like, does that feel about right that everybody has kind of a connection to an angel or an archangel in this way? Yeah, I think uh, exactly that. Like, it's just like the stem of that. We all come from the creator and we all come from some point of Archangel Michael. And then, then there's different varieties of like where we are in, in that lineage, right? And where we fall, even though we may not be a direct correlation of that of that lineage, we could be like Archangel Gabriel. We can be part of, of that connection or celestial or anything of that nature. When we think about it, even the newer souls, right? Because we're not all old souls. We all haven't lived billions of lifetimes. Some of us have been here for a very long time, not on the life, like on, not on this life planet, but in like into the omniverse, we've been around for quite a bit of time. And then we have newer souls and those newer souls can stem from different lineages, but it all comes back down to the creator and then to the next given given of life, right? Or it comes directly from the creator. So I think that either way, we are all connected in some form and we all have that connection to the angelic lineages, just as we do with the ascended masters, the councils, everybody has access and part of their integration of their being comes from these soul essences. Um, you mentioned having four near-death experiences, which I'm so curious about. Were these near-death experiences something um, deriving from trauma or illness, or are we talking about near-death experiences as a kind of astral projection? Like, Because you can really experience yeah. what it is like to be yep. outside of your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done astral projection also, and part of being a shaman, we do do, do the death and dying journey and ceremony which is a very beautiful ceremony. So I don't want people to be afraid of that or be fearful of that. Death is actually really beautiful. There is so much incredibleness that happens once we pass that veil. But no, these were these were linear. These were 3D. The first one was we went over a cliff and the three others were connected to a health issue. I was hemorrhaging on three different occasions 
and nearly lost my life every single time. So yeah, it was pretty intense. It really shook the foundation of who I was and what I was telling myself, the story that I was telling myself, that I was happy, that I was content, that I was just getting through the day, but I was living on everybody else's perceptions and perspectives on how I should live my life. So that is the paradigm shift that happened for me. That was the seismic shift that happened for me from being the nice girl syndrome. Yes, yes, yes. Being kind, being this to really stepping into my power of advocacy, stepping into my gifts and abilities and disregarding what everybody else was trying to say or to direct me towards. So that was where that empowerment came from. And then I've had a lot of astral projections when we go into ceremony about the death and dying, especially as a death doula, if we are bringing them through and we're making sure that they cross the veil. One of the journeys that we do before we ever do this is we do a death and dying ceremony so that they can know what death really is. So they're not fearful, right? And most people, when they're on their deathbed, they're like, oh, I see the angels. They're talking to me or I see this. And, and like, those aren't illusions. Like this is where you're your body is starting to come into the quantum, right? You're starting to come into your soul essence more than your physical essence, right? Your auric field is now diminishing and coming back to the soul orb that it needs to in order to go into its next soul contract. Now in your near-death experiences, I just can hear my audience, they have, they have questions. Yeah. So <laughs> are these traditional, like you see a light, you have a life review, you, you see a being, or was it a little different for you? Yeah. So it was only the one time that I really was being pulled toward. It was one time when I was hemorrhaging that I was being pulled toward the light. And then there was something inside that was just like, nope, it's not your time, but this is what it is. It's time to go back. And I was like, and I just felt like, but I wanted to go toward it because it was so beautiful. It was so luminescent and it was so warm. Like it was a feeling of unconditional love, like all these stresses, all these worries that we carry within our emotional, our physical and our intellectual body are no longer there when we go into this different transportation of our being. So I can see why people would want to go toward that. And in, in that sense, because it feels so peaceful, but then there's a fear that comes in. If the ego is able to kick in, if you're not past that stage where you're like, it would be fearful. It would be fearful to know that this part of your physical life is coming to the end of this part of your journey, right? But your journey's not ending, but just in this lifetime it is. So yeah, it was just the one experience. And then I've experienced a lot of astral projections and going into ceremony of really going into the light and understanding. And then there's soul contracts that are made that we come back and we fulfill our sacred and soul purpose, right? Because it's really easy to want to stay there because there are loved ones, your ancestors are there and it's infinite love and beauty and light. Like that's what it is when you pass that veil. There's no dark energy. The dark energy stays in the middle world. It's beautiful. That's good to know <laughs> that the dark energy stays in the middle, middle world. Have you ever heard of the theory of the reincarnation soul trap? Yep. You have. Yeah. Okay. Um, I remember way back in the day listening to Art Bell on Coast to Coast and somebody brought this topic up and it scared the heck out of him. Like this idea that you could be deceived after death by beings of light that you think are your ancestors and family, but they're really archons just trying to get you right back into the reincarnation loop. Do you believe in this kind of thing? I think that there is always going to be dark energy out there. There's always going to be the polarity, the duality of who we are, right? And it's about acknowledging that, but it's also, we have spiritual guides, we have animal guides, we have everyone there that is guiding us. And it's about trusting, right? It's about trusting where you're being guided. If something, even in any aspect in astral projection, if you are not in alignment, if something in you says, mm, I'm not sure about this, you already know, you intuitively already know, and anything can masquerade itself as light, right? And that's why it's important that anything that we allow to come within our energy field or within our vicinity is that it's coming in the highest deities of light, that we are putting a grounding exercise, that we're putting protection elements in, and we make sure that we have this shield and it can only come to us if we accept it and if we permit it to come into our energetic space. It comes through the crown when it's really coming from divinity. Anything else that comes in any way else of our body usually isn't of the light. <laughs>